how do you even go get a job anywhere? Mm -hmm. And um, so my mom um, found out, well, first you go to the employment office and they, um, they will tell you who's hiring. And so the, the people who do the hiring are called uh, contratistas, which means the contractor. Mm -hmm. And so that person will get their crew together. Mm -hmm. And they only have a certain number of ladders available. So you need to get to the field very early in the morning. If you want a job, show up there. So you show up there, but other people may have heard that he was they were hiring. So if you show up late, you don't get a ladder, you can't you can't work. Okay. Now, not everybody has to have a ladder. That's up to you. But if you you have to have a ladder because you have to pick the top part of the tree, and the only way is with a ladder. Now, the more ladders in the family, the better because then like usually a mom and dad will will have a ladder and they will cover the tree and the top and then the children or the younger people they pick the bottom speed is the name of the game so you want to as soon as you can move to another set you want to go to another set now there are several families there so when i say set i mean four or six trees and when you're you can't move until you're done and then once you're done you have to go wherever the next set is, and there are other families next to you. So you may have to walk quite a ways to get to the next set. So you wanna leave someone behind to make sure, like if you're picking oranges, to make sure all the oranges were picked. Because if you don't do that, let's assume you left two oranges right in the middle of the tree where it was really hard to get to. So you just go, eh, I'm moving to the next set. The contractor comes and checks the trees and says, ah, I see two oranges. They'll go and say, you have to go back. Go get those two oranges. And so now, the only way to get them, you climb the tree to go get those two oranges. And they'll, they'll check the boxes also. And you can't yank the fruit. And so, like, if you're picking an orange, you have to grab it with one hand. You have the scissors. You have to cut it right above. You can't just yank it because if you yank it, uh, according to what they told us, they won't be as juicy. The, the juice comes out because you yanked it, so you've actually taken part of the peel off. So now it'll dry out, and when it gets to the market, people won't like it. So it's, it's, um, it's not as easy as it sounds to go and, and work in the fields. So... Um, it's, it's like a family affair. Um, now, a lot of people, especially people who are just there for the season, like from Mexico, for example, they're young men and, and they, they don't have children. So they usually will team up, usually two of them, and then they switch off and do the top and the bottom, and then they'll do the bottom, you know, and so on. And in the case of your parents, it was your mom and your dad doing that. Right. And, and then in the in the off season, I mean in the summer season, you right. guys the kids also were involved. And on the weekends and in the holidays. Yeah. So so you work year round as well. Yeah, yeah, it's year round. And for example, my sister Annie, she was only um, like four and a half years old when we came. She would get taken to to work. Um, it wasn't really to work. It was just they were not going to pay for a babysitter. They didn't right. have the money. So they would take her, and she would um, uh, get underneath a tree at, at four and a half, five years old, and just pick whatever she could and make her boxes anyway. So we would work um, basically on, on, on Saturdays and Sundays. Sundays... Um, most of the time we would not work because my parents insisted that we needed to go to church. church. Uh, so, but Saturday we would definitely go to work all the holidays, um, all s the summer months. Um, and a lot of times in the summer months we would go up north to different labor camps. We only did that for a few years because we were having to miss school for that. And my parents didn't like the idea. We, we didn't miss that much school, but they didn't like for us to miss any school. They felt that education was important. And so we did that until age, I was 15, 14, 
when we stopped doing that. So we did that for like three years. Even though there was work in Porterville, going to the labor camps was, was important for them because in the winter months, there isn't as much work. Mm -hmm. And that's when the farm workers really suffer because they want to work, but there isn't any work. It's raining, it's cold. Um, so you have to have enough of savings to tide you over. How much were you paid and how difficult it was for you to really make and and meet during that time? It, it, was, it was very difficult. Uh, but in Texas, my parents were making uh, 50 cents an hour. When they came to California, they were getting paid a dollar an hour. So we just thought we, like this was the equivalent of <laughs> <laughs> picking the money off of the trees. But um, but what we didn't realize is the expenses were so much mm -hmm. higher in California than mm -hmm. in Texas. We lived in a trailer, a uh, little trailer house, tiny little trailer house that belonged to a friend. But when she came, when they came back from the labor camps, we had to give that up. So we, um, we had to sell our house in Texas um, and we bought a house in Porterville for $2,000. It, it, um, it was a one-bedroom house, and uh, the one bedroom uh, had, had no concrete underneath. It was dirt, and then somebody put linoleum on top. I mean, that's all we could really afford. So eventually my parents, you know, they, they got paid a little bit more money, but like I said, the most they ever got paid was like $1.25 an hour working in the field. And that's why we would go to the labor camps where they would get paid $1.75 an hour. Now, fortunately for, for us, um, I was able to get a job, a good job, uh, working after school. And the job that I got was through the migrant ministry. Mm -hmm. um, and um, how did you learn about the, mi the migrant ministry? My dad contacted Jim Drake about the program. He had advertised that he was putting together a group for self self help housing, and so the idea was um, you get a group of people um, and you work on each other's homes and you you build these nights or homes. So my father, of course, was very interested in doing that. You know, my father was always doing whatever, what was best for the family. So he, he and my uncles and other compadres and other friends, they all approached Jim Drake and Jim Drake talked to my dad. Um, and uh, they, they got to know each other very well. They had these meetings about what they were gonna do. But uh, unfortunately it turned out that it wasn't possible because um, it couldn't be done in Porterville, even though it was the population was very low. It was still too high for this self-help program. Uh, also, you had to be a citizen, and a lot of the people in the group were not citizens. Most of them were, but there were some that were not. So, um, so everybody said, "Okay, well then we're going to have to abandon this project." And then Jim Drake said, "Well, since you guys are already together as a group." Uh, why don't you stay together and um, why don't you call yourselves the Farm Workers Organization of Porterville? And so everybody talked and they said, yeah, well, why don't we do that? And so they did. So they, uh, and they selected my dad to be the, the president of the Farm Workers Organization. And so Jim Drake said, well, um, we have an office, um, it's paid by the migrant ministry, and uh, we can use that office for meetings. And uh, my dad said, well, we can use my house for meetings, uh, our, my one bedroom house. <laughs> so um, our house was actually more convenient because the office was actually a tiny, tiny office. And so when my dad was getting involved with the farm workers organization, Right away, of course, he brought my tío Beto, my tío Rico, my tío Lacho, my, you know, his compadre, my padrino. And, and by then we had met all these people at the labor camp who were from the same area. So they all came on board and they were all, they all got along great. And um, they thought the same way. They had the same kinds of goals. And um, I don't remember exactly what the number was in terms of, because I think it evolved. I think it started when it was the self-help housing. 
it was a small group. I'm guessing right now that it was probably like about 12, maybe 15 men, mm -hmm. and it was only men. Um, and then once it became the Farm Workers Organization, then it got much bigger because now the women could um, be a part of it. And um, in whatever capacity, I mean, of course, at first it was just have the women do the cooking, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, but um, but soon it became, well, we need their help for different things. Exactly. And so it became double, triple, and then people started joining. Um, everybody wanted the 33 cents a gallon gas. Everyone needed parts for the car. And then they started seeing the benefits of um, getting together, not necessarily for purposes of farm worker uh, benefits, but more for um, where do you go to work, you know, that kind of thing, and how much are you getting paid, and how is that contractor versus this contractor. So what happened is my dad got blacklisted because he was always talking to people about joining the union. So because farm workers have no protections, that there was no union, so it was all like come and work here, you know, the contractor, uh, was the one that you had to contact. So all of a sudden, all the contractors started telling my dad, oh, we don't have work for you. Then they needed, uh, uh, like, a, well, they called it a secretary, but it was really a jack of all trades. They needed somebody to run the office because there was nobody there. And so um, Jim Drake asked if if I was willing to go and do that and that and there was gonna be typing and uh, I didn't know how to type, but I could do the two finger typing. And so they, uh, so I would do typing, I would collect the dues, I would pump the gas, I would take the orders, uh, whatever, you know, I worked two hours a day after school. And so I started working there in the eighth grade. So that would have been 1964. So that's why I'm guessing that it was um, probably 63 when they got together. It wasn't really formal, it wasn't, you know, at first. And then and then they started saying, well, we should pay some dues and start paying some dues. And so that we can do different, different things that we might need, that kind of thing. Um, but very soon thereafter, uh, Cesar Chavez came to, to meet with the group. Now, how he knew about it, I assume it was through, through Jim, Jim Drake, Drake. Yeah. you know, because mm -hmm. he came to the office and um, uh, so I was the first, first person in Portoville to meet him because I was running the office. And, and I, I remember I felt so bad because Jim Drake and David Havens would tell me, don't open up the office before 3.30 because you know people are like lined up and if you come at 3.15, they want you to pump gas right away. So just tell them it's closed. Somebody comes, you say it's closed until 3.30. I say, okay. So <laughs> I follow instructions. So I get to the office at like 3.15 and Cesar Chavez is sitting in front of the door. But I don't know who it is and nobody had warned me. So I go, office is closed. <laughs> you have to wait till 3.30. <laughs> and he just says, okay, you know. And uh, so I'm like, there was a little chocolate store next door, so I'm in the chocolate store, you know, <laughs> waiting for 3.30, and then, then I go over there, open up the office, and then, uh, and I, I had heard the name Cesar Chavez. Of course, he wasn't, it wasn't like now, like, you know, he be, obviously became a legend, but, um, but I certainly knew who he was mm -hmm. uh, from just conversations with Jim Drake, and so I felt very bad that I made him just sit there <laughs> on the stoop and wait for me to open the office. But anyway, so he he had come. Uh, he wanted to meet with my father, and so I told him, "Well, my father will be here in two hours um, to you know pick me up." In those days, we have cell phones. We there was no way for me to reach my father to say. You know, we, we didn't even have a home phone. So it's, he'll be here in two hours. And he said, okay, I'll wait. So he waited and by then we had- um, Did you have a chance to talk to him while he was there? I, you know, I didn't talk to him. I was, I was embarrassed first of all. And I just, I felt uh, awed by having this important person there. So he talked, my father came, 
talked, and then my father said, well, why don't we um, schedule a meeting with, with everyone, and you can come and talk to us, and, and it's up to the membership, see what they want to do. And so his thing was, you know, the, the Cesar Chavez would always um, give an example of, you know, you take a stick, and it's so easy to break. But now you put like four sticks together, mm. and that's the Makes it more the, difficult. the strength of the union. Mm -hmm. And and everybody agreed that um, yeah that they should join the uh, his organization, the National and Farm Workers so Association. Right? The far, it was the Farm Workers Association, so AFWA at that time. Um, and then um, they decided to keep my father as the president of the local chapter in Porterville because, you know, it would be somebody mm -hmm. needs to be in charge, and he had been president already, so they kept him as president so that he could communicate with, um, with Cesar Chavez.